um, Bishop Stephen, for your welcome. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to me to be back in Sheffield. I thought on the train yesterday coming over from Stockport, which is where I lived and when I was commuting to Sheffield, it felt like coming home. Being on that train is like being home, Rim. Uh, so it's great to be here and I'm really enjoying the, uh, the light and space in this beautiful cathedral. Um, Maestro, Mike, could we flick to the very end? Bishop John this morning introduced us to, got us thinking about the angst associated with the idea of leadership. And I'd just like to flash that up as we begin because I think those are some of the general questions that he raised this morning. Some of them we touched on in our question time. Uh, there were a lot of questions raised this morning which I would love to have gone into in more detail. Um, but just to say, to flash up at the beginning, these are some of the questions that inspired our work in the, uh, the Faith and Order Commission uh, when we produced this report which will be published in book form, in a rather smaller and more manageable form, but with more in it, uh, hopefully in time for General Synod in July. I think uh, it was in July 2009 that General Synod passed a motion calling for a study of senior leadership in the Church of England. And in one way, this is one kind of report to that, and Bishop Stephen's training programme is another kind of response to that. So there's been very much a lot of work going on in the church since then, thinking about leadership, both on the practical side in terms of skills training, but also what we tried to do in this report and what I want to share with you this afternoon is thinking about leadership in the Christian tradition, as Bishop <coughs> Stephen said, one of the oldest traditions of reflection on leadership, particularly in the Bible and in the New Testament, which is the area I'm particularly interested in this afternoon. Now, I've, um, I think we can flip back to the beginning, Mike, if we may, to, yeah, thank you. So, what I want to do with you this afternoon is not to get into the debates, but to get into the New Testament material, to try and give you a handle and a framework for looking at some, some very familiar passages, some perhaps less familiar, that relate to the spiritual dimension of leadership. It's actually, as I've found, remarkably consistent across the New Testament writers, so I, in a sense I could jump in at almost any point and I'd be coming up with similar results. But what I'm trying to do this afternoon is to give you a broad sweep rather than a detailed exegesis. In some ways my favourite way of working on this material is to sit down with a small group and actually uh, break open the Bible and look at the stuff and delve into what we can actually find in the passages. And I would encourage you to do that either on your own or with groups. And if I may say so, that uh, FAOC report is designed partly, it's not designed as a study guide as such, but it's designed to have material in it that would stimulate you to go and read and study, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest for yourself. So if you find the sweeping approach this afternoon frustrating, I hope you will feel either sufficiently inspired or sufficiently irritated to go away and do some detailed exegesis yourself. So let me start with a passage of scripture, actually very similar to our gospel reading in the Eucharist, uh, but this is from Luke's gospel. Um, again, it's the same debate that uh, we read from Matthew, but Luke places this in the context of the Last Supper. Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them and those in authority are called benefactors. And not so with you. Rather let the greatest among you become as the youngest and the leader as one who serves. For which is the greater, one who sits at table or one who serves? Is it not the one who sits at table? But I am among you 
as one who serves. Now, am I getting this right? No, go the other way. Okay. Now, as you can pick up, that passage is built on a series of binary opposites between high status roles and low status roles. And let's not forget, Jesus is speaking from a social context that is intensely hierarchical. I have to say, one of my privileges when I was in Sheffield was uh, supervising postgraduate students. And uh, a number of our students were from Korea. And one of them told me that, about his reaction to the story of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. He said in Korea, which is in a very traditional hierarchical society, for a teacher to wash his students' feet is deeply, deeply shocking. I think we've got to think ourselves back into that world. We sort of tend to gloss over this because we're used to the story. So we've got this duality between high status roles and low status roles, greatest, the least, the younger, the senior, seniors and juniors, those who sit at table and those who are waiting on. And the leader obviously belongs on the high status side, the one who serves belongs on the low status side. It's the difference, Jesus says, between being served, again, sitting at table, having people bring your food to you, and serving, being one of the waiting on staff. Difference between being the first and being the slave of all. But Jesus, in his, the typical way that his teaching works, and uh, is particularly striking in this passage, does a flip over. He reverses those polarities by saying, yes, but I am among you, and I, clearly, he is there as their leader. I am among you as the one who serves. And that really raises the question, can we talk about leadership at all in a Christian context, and particularly in the context of the Eucharist? Now, I think when you look more closely at the passage, we can see that Jesus actually isn't saying let there be no leaders among you, though in Christian history some people have interpreted it that way. But let your leadership not be like this, not like the secular models. And in fact, when we look carefully at the New Testament, and especially I'm going to be looking at Paul's letters, there is a lot of leadership. There's a lot of leadership going on in the New Testament church. And it's foolish, I think, to deny that. And there is a remarkably consistent pattern of what we might call elder paranesis or first century leadership training. Those who exercise leadership in the church have to be constantly vigilant not to fall into secular patterns of hegemony, not to act the boss or act the master over those entrusted to their care. And the key is twofold. This is really the theme of uh, this afternoon, to remember that they are the servant and not the master, not the law, not the kurios, and to model their leadership style on the way Jesus himself led, which is as the one who comes among us as one who serves. So there's, there's two sides to this. Now that brings us to the familiar idea of servant leadership. Perhaps it's too familiar. I was at a leadership training event last year in, at Wilson Carlisle here in Sheffield. Um, possibly somebody from here was there. I asked the question, what do we lose if we routinely substitute the word leadership for the traditional ministry? Again, Bishop John raised this this morning. I was, I have to say, rather shocked that a whole room full of leadership practitioners it didn't seem to have struck them that the word minister means servant. Minister is simply the Latin for diakonos. Perhaps we've become too used to seeing ministry in a church setting simply as a functional title for the person who stands up at the front and tells people what to do, hence a high status role. So I think it's timely to consider what we actually mean when we use that concept. And uh, I mean, a couple of quotes there on servant leadership. 
Only the slave of all is qualified to govern all. Slavery to others is embodied in the act of dying for them. This is a summary of Jesus' ministry. Jesus carries out the will of the Heavenly Father for the sake of those to whom he is sent. That's uh, very pertinent comments, but what does it actually mean in terms of leadership? Well, one question to ask is what does this word, that I'm translating service, actually mean, the Greek word diakonia? As we saw in the Luke passage, Jesus uses it several times. The one who sits at table is the one who is served as opposed to the ones who serve at table. And that's the context we would normally put it in. But uh, Australian Catholic scholar John Collins wrote a big book on this um, in 1990, which has begun to sort of weave its way into the bloodstream a bit of thinking about ministry. And he says we need to question this equation between ministry and service. He wants to question the idea that um, diaconia is in some sense inherently menial service, that it belongs on the low status side of that uh, polarity. So he argues, he looks at every example of the word and says, well, it's not in the root sense serving at table, though a lot of the times that's what it means. A diakonos is a go-between or an agent. So somebody who is sent with a message, it's just as relevant to ministry of the word as to waiting at table. Um, if any of you... I asked last night if anybody has a Scottish or Irish connection, you might recognize the phrase going the messages or doing the messages, meaning going shopping. I know uh, um, Christine here has a bag which is a message poke. A message poke, that's right. A shopping bag is a message poke. It's the same kind of semantic shift. It's an uh, interesting bit of semantics if you're interested in that. But he wants us to think, as I say, are we right in equating ministry, diaconia, with menial service? Well, I think he's right to raise the question, who are we serving when we talk about being a servant? Is it about serving the church? Is it about serving humanity? Is it about serving God? Um, I think he's wrong when he says, but that means it isn't a low status thing, because surely if we flick back uh, to this passage, the, as I say, the polarity implies that the one who serves belongs on the low status side and the, the leader and being served belongs on the high status. I don't think you can get away from that. So I think he's protesting a little bit too much there. But nevertheless, it is valuable to ask that question. This is how he translates Mark 10:45. The servant of God, Jesus is the servant of God carrying out a charge laid on him, a particular person, com, personal commission under God, the opposite of all that is powerful and glorious. Okay, so that's one thing to think about. And the second is, what do we mean by leadership? I, um, I think it's interesting to ask when the term comes into Christian discourse and the discourse of the church. I um, started looking at when it starts to creep into New Testament Bible translations. And uh, it's further back than you think. For instance, the New English Bible in 1961 for um, the famous passage about the bishop in 1 Timothy chapter 3 talks about the leader. So leadership is coming in even back in the 60s. And I found this quote from C.S. Lewis dating from 1954. I think actually a lot of this is a post-war phenomenon. He's talking about the difference between leaders and rulers. Just again, why we use one word and there's been a shift from using ruler to using leader, even in politics. Leaders is the modern word of a ruler one asks Justice, incorruption, diligence, perhaps clemency, of a leader, dash, initiative, and I suppose what people call magnetism or personality. Be interested to know if you would uh, associate those ideas with leadership. And the fact is that if you look back into 19th century writing, for example, about the role of bishops, what they, they don't talk about leadership, they talk about governance and governing and ruling. That's what bishops do. So is leadership a sort of softer word? But it's also a word that I think in a post-war context is a word that we're a bit suspicious of. 
I think I was alerted to this when uh, talking to my niece, who was a member of a, a New Frontiers church, which had no ordained ministry, and apparently not a pastor. Well, they did have a pastor. They didn't call him the pastor or the minister. They called him the leader. And my niece would say, I need to talk to the leader about this. And I was thinking, in what way is the leader, which sounds awfully like the Fuhrer to me, an improvement on the pastor or the minister in a, in a very non-hierarchical church or anti-hierarchical church? So it's a question about what words mean and how we use them. So how does the New Testament itself talk about leadership? Again, you can go into the detail here, but I'll skim over this. The, w the New Testament doesn't use any of the common words for ruling or power uh, in relation to church leadership. Words like arche or dunamis. Interesting to think why. It talks about political leaders in terms of rule and power, not church leaders. There is this constant concern, refrain about acting the boss, acting the master. That's something that church leaders are obviously tempted to do, but are warned against doing. There is a sense of delegated authority. Exousia is used, Paul uses it sometimes, of his own apostolic authority, but not very often. Exousia, we sometimes translate as power, but it's more permission. I'm allowed to have this, to have, having authority in that sense. The word that most closely means leader is hegumenos, only occurs five times in the New Testament in three passages. Luke 22, that's the passage we just saw, in Acts 15, leading men among the brethren, um, and in Hebrews 13. And you could ask of hegumenos, it means somebody who leads the way. It could mean somebody who guides, a guide along the path, guiding I don't know, a party across the moors. It is commonly used in the Greek of the period of the New Testament of political rulers. So, but as I say, only in three places is that used of in the New Testament. So that's just a warning at the start. Nevertheless, it would be a mistake to think that, that because of that there isn't any leadership in the New Testament. There is plenty of leadership and there is a lot about leadership, a lot of reflection on it. So let me take, no, I'm going the wrong way again. Yes, no, that is right. Leadership patterns in the New Testament. Let's go to one passage which shows us some of the patterns of leadership. Just um, grab myself a drink. If you have a Bible or you've got the app, this is a good opportunity to uh, look it up. Acts chapter 14 is, and it's only a couple of verses again, interesting passage. This is the end of Paul's first missionary journey. Paul is, I suppose you would say, a leader. He's part of the ministry team in the church of Antioch, um, where we're told there were prophets and teachers, and Paul or Saul, as he is at that stage, is one of them. Saul and Barnabas are sent out by the Church of Antioch as delegates of the Church of Antioch to go on mission and preach the gospel. So on that journey, Paul preaches the gospel in Antioch of Pisidia, Iconium, Lystra and Derbe. We don't know how long it took, but probably a few months at most. And then having gone that route, he turns round and goes back. Um, and this is what Luke says. Um, they returned to Lystra and Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. So Paul there is exercising his own leadership, first in church planting and then in going back, strengthening and encouraging. That's quite clear to see. But what he does then is he appointed elders for them, elders in every church, with prayer and fasting, and they committed them to the Lord in whom they believed. So we've got Paul's leadership, but now there are also local church leaders who are called elders in this passage, 
And again, we find there are local church leaders all over the New Testament. Sometimes they're called elders and sometimes not. And then having appointed these elders with no training, and we wonder about their formation, um, Paul then leaves them to get on with it, blithely entrusting these newly hatched disciples to the Lord in whom they had come to believe. As I say, we can allow at most a few months between the initial evangelization, and these are pagans, don't forget, um, of these little, tiny Christian groups, and Paul's returning strength and encouragement, and then leave them to get on with it. He leaves them to stand on their own two feet, and the episode closes with Paul and Barnabas going back to the church of Antioch in Syria, from which they had been entrusted to the grace of God, to the task which they fulfilled. Now, what I want to suggest to you is that there are three levels or dimensions of leadership there. As I said last night, I had to be careful in this context talking about three dimensions of leadership because your bishop has written an excellent book, which I hope you've all read, on three dimensions of ministry. I'm just using the metaphor of dimensions in a slightly different way, and as we'll see in a moment, I've actually got a two-dimensional diagram to bring this out. But I want you to think about there is Paul's leadership, there is the local leadership of the local church, which perforce he has to leave to get on with it because he doesn't have any means of connecting with them except occasional letters. And then there is this person, this business of the Lord in whom they had come to believe. There is a third dimension, and this is what I want to think about, the spiritual dimension, if you like, of how both these leaders connect to God. Now, think about that and think, if you can, it's quite an easy diagram to have in mind, of a triangular relationship between those three points of an equilateral triangle. I shall produce one on here in a minute or two, but it's a little further down the line. Now let's turn to Acts chapter 20. The Apostle and the Elders. Luke actually tells us very little in Acts about the internal structures of Paul's churches. He's much more interested in church planting. So these are two rare glimpses of how the church has actually worked. So you know this passage is where Paul sends from Miletus to the Elders of Ephesus um, and brings them to where he's waiting by the ship ready to go to Jerusalem and his discourse to the Ephesian Elders. Now this is Paul's farewell discourse, it is effectively the point at which his ministry, his active missionary work is coming to an end. And he knows that. He says, Behold, I'm going to Jerusalem bound in the Spirit, not knowing what shall befall me, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me that imprisonment and afflictions await me. So he's really, this is his testament, if you like. This is what I want to tell you before I leave you. And the scene ends with everybody in tears because he had said, you shall see my face no more. It, he says a lot in this about his own ministry, the diaconia that he calls it, that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the good news of God's grace. So we've got quite a lot in this about Paul's leadership. We've also got not quite so much, but a really significant point about these local leaders, these local elders about what he wants to say to them about their leadership and their ministry. Watch out for yourselves and for all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. They are the episcopoi. These are the original bishops to shepherd the church of God. Now, think first about, sorry, flick too many. I hope, there's a lot of sun on this. Are people able to see it? I hope so. It's, uh, um, what does he say about his own ministry? Well, it's interesting. It's partly about what he does. He says, I did not shrink from declaring to you what was profitable, teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance to God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's about preaching the gospel. It's about the ministry of the word. That's a fundamental part of Paul's diaconia, his commission that he has received from the Lord. 
But it's also about who he is. It's about lifestyle, it's about being as well as doing. You yourselves know how I lived among you all the time from the first day I set foot in Asia. So it's not just who he is in himself, but who he is in relationship, how I lived among you. Serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and trials. And again, it's a two-way relationship. It's, if you like, the horizontal relationship with those, the church, and it's the church and the local churches and their leaders. But there's also the vertical relationship with the Lord who has given him this commission and to whom he is serving as he carries it out. So in carrying out this commission to the church to preach the gospel, he is serving the Lord. Um, and that runs all the way through this. Um, you get again a, I say, a list of all the things he's, he's done there, but it also, again, we come back at the end to who he is. He says, looking forward, um, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. Um, I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. I wasn't interested, I wasn't in it for the money. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities. He's going back to the way he was and they know that because they've seen it, because he lived among them. Uh, in all things I have shown you, shown by example, shown by being a role model, that by so toiling one must help the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. And again, it's really interesting how those ideas of Paul's being a self-supporting apostle, working to support his ministry, is also setting an example, and it's an example that throws light back all the time on the words and the example of Christ. Now, if we look more briefly at the, there we go, the saints, or the elders, their ministry. Again, they, like Paul, have received their ministry from God. It says, it isn't I made you elders, we don't know who appointed these elders, we're never told. But it was the Holy Spirit has made you episcopi, overseers, and has made, given you the task of caring for the church of God. Not my church, not my flock, but God's church, God's flock, which he obtained with the blood of his son. And therefore, be alert. Um, where are we? Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock. Okay, so that's what they have to do. And part of their work is to keep an eye on the apostle himself and the, to follow the example that he has given them. So watching, remembering, and knowing is really important part of this relationship. Now, I want to flick ahead here. What I want to, uh, here's the God dimension again in both those passages. I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among the saints. Again, Paul is leaving them, but he knows he's leaving them in good hands because he really believes in this God. And at the end of Acts 14, Paul himself has been commended for his work to the grace of God. The grace of God is what he relies on for his own leadership. Now, we can see the same pattern in Hebrews 13. Uh, and in 1 Peter 5. Again, you've got the apostle speaking there as a fellow elder, speaking to the elders. Tend the flock of God that is in your charge, not domineering, not lording it over them, being examples when the chief shepherd is manifest. Again, it's not your flock, it's the flock belongs to the chief shepherd. You are under shepherds. Remarkable, I think, how these same themes come time and time again. And again, the God dimension there. May the God of peace equip you to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. Just stop and think about those words. You know, we hear them, we use them, we use them in blessings. They are absolutely remarkable words. Because Paul, Peter, the author of Hebrews, have nothing else to rely on. If this church is to grow, it's only God who can make it grow.
And again for 1 Peter 5, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, establish, strengthen and settle you. It's that direct relationship between, not only between the leader and God, but between the led and God, which is what holds the church together. So let me come to a diagram which I hope makes this clearer. I like this one because actually if I had a flip chart, I can draw it. I mean, even I can draw an equilateral triangle. And it's, I find it's a really helpful way to, to, to think about what's going on in these passages. So think of God at the top, B is the church, the local churches, the local congregations, those who are led, uh, and C is those who are leaders. So you can see it as a relationship between God leader and led, um, or as we see between the uh, local leadership of the elders and the translocal leadership of the apostles. And my point really, and the point to hold on to, is that this is a relational term. Leadership is a relational term. But the relationships are in three, I'm going to say dimensions, don't somebody tell me they're not dimensions, you know what I mean. Um, there is what God does to call the leader. Paul is very conscious of being called by God. He wouldn't do this, and that's what diaconia means. Diaconia means it. it's a commission received from God. So in response, Paul is um, responding to God, serving God, obeying God. You can look at all the verbs that describe that relationship. But Equally important is the fact that God calls his people. The flock is God's. It's not the leader's flock. And they then respond in faith and trust and obedience to God. Just in passing, Paul in his letters, I think, never speaks of obedience of the led to himself as leader. There's only one place, and oddly English translations put obedience to me, that's in Philippians chapter 2. There's no justification for that in the Greek, and I think almost always, always Paul means your obedience to God. But on the horizontal axis, there is the relationship, the crucial relationship between the leader and the led, and it's a two-way relationship, and again you can explore all sorts of aspects of that. You could say that the leadership skills and training is about what happens on the horizontal axis. axis. It's not the only way to approach that, but it is really important within that context to think how we relate to each other. But the two other sides of the triangle are, in my mind, what holds it together and what makes Christian leadership what it is, leadership in the church. So if you would hold that diagram in mind. This is the leadership triangle. It's Im important that it's equilateral. Both sides are equally important. Um, you find the same pattern in the Old Testament. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. The, um, there is, I think, church, church history shows a tendency over 2,000 years to reduce this triangular set of relationships to a management diagram, a vertical um, cascade of uh, management and leadership. Um, a more, you might say, I'm ready to be shot down on this, but I think a, a traditional Catholic view um, would be God at the top. Um, it doesn't say that there, this is, that's making a different point. But God at the top put the apostolic leadership in the middle and the people at the bottom. Uh, to quote pre-Vatican II, this is not current Roman Catholic theology, but pre-Vatican II theology, Pope Pius X said, there are two classes of people in the church, the leaders and the led. The role of the people is only to be led. I think, no, no, surely that's not what we believe about the people of God. The Reformation tended to flip it around. So it put God, then the church itself, and then the church chooses leaders as may be expedient. But again, I think that's a distortion. I think that doesn't do justice to the fact that God calls leaders and equips leaders, sometimes whether the church likes it or not. So it's this battle to hold that 
triangular relationship in place. <coughs> now, what I want to do in the rest of the time is to look at the ecclesiological grammar of the Pauline letters, which is a posh way of saying how this triangular pattern and I found in Acts, Hebrews 1, Peter, some of the later New Testament texts, it's actually already there in Paul. It's deeply embedded in his letters. And I believe it's, in many ways, it's what the letters are about, is reinforcing that triangular set of relationships. And let me take you to um, 1 Thessalonians as a good place to illustrate that. I may say the best way to do this piece of work is to buy yourself a set of coloured felt-tip pens, do some printouts of Bible passages, or if you have an old Bible, mark it up in colour for yourself, and do a colour-coded marking, just marking, just doing the verbs is a good thing. Um, what the, each verse tells us about those three relationships, thinking about the three axes of the triangle, the relationship between leaders and led, the relationship between leaders and God, the relationship between the church and God. And all the letters in the New Testament, apart from Philemon and the pastorals, are addressed to a church in the plural, that is you, meaning a congregation, a local, um, local instantiation of the people of God. So if I may briefly just uh, show how this would work with 1 Thessalonians. Start with the beginning of any letter. Paul, Silvanus and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. Hardly worth reading, we often don't bother because it's just the greeting. But hang on a minute, what's that doing? It's talking about the apostolic leaders, Paul, Silvanus and Timothy. And note, Paul is almost always speaking as a member of a team. It's binding him together with the church of the Thessalonians. And it's binding both of them together with God, with God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. In God the Father, that little word in, does all the work of binding the three together. What makes the church the church is her relationship with the God who calls her into existence. Look at the beginnings of Romans or 1 Corinthians, spelt out a little bit more, the God who calls you into holiness. And yes, this does mean this individual localised ecclesia, because what is true of the whole church of God is true of each local instantiation of it. So this relationship, this three-way relationship, is inscribed into the grammar of the letter. The vertical relationship between God and the church is revealed in the relational terms which have God as subject and you as object. So the church is loved by God, it's chosen by God, it's empowered by God, it's powered by the Holy Spirit. And that in turn enables this church to become a model and a source of God's word for other churches. Conversely, what the church does, going upwards, the triangle upwards towards God, is defined in terms of activity directed towards God. They believe or trust in God, they hope, they imitate. Yes, there are human agents in this relationship. So the foundation narrative for this church is bound up with receiving or welcoming the word spoken by the apostles. You received the word that we spoke. You received it as the word of the living God. But they're not becoming disciples of the apostles. They're, becoming, they're turning to God to serve the true and living God, waiting for the revelation of God's Son from heaven. And their ongoing story, however much Paul is part of it, is about the empowerment or inward working, the energeia, the energy of God's Holy Spirit, the calling to walk worthily of God, the power, the dunamis of the God who makes this possible. Repeatedly in 1 Thessalonians, and again this is something to trace right through the New Testament, God himself, autos or theos, 
uh, with the final verse at the end of 1 Thessalonians 5. Faithful is he who calls you, who also will do it. Faithful is the one who calls you. Pistos or kalon, refrain of hope and uh, power that runs right through the New Testament. Then if we look down the AC axis, we can see equally that what defines the apostle and his team is being apostles of Christ. That is, Paul is an agent or a surrogate or a delegate, not of the church, not even the Jerusalem church, but of Christ himself. He's approved by God. He is entrusted with the word of God. His task is to speak God's word, to share God's grace and peace. His task in, on the horizontal plane is encouraging and strengthening, the same that we saw in Acts. Keeping in touch, networking, keeping local churches in touch with each other. That's a really important function of the letters. Um, and his own relationship to God is characterized by humility. He's not seeking glory, by prayer. Think of how many times Paul says in his, all his letters, every time I mention you in my prayers. Think of those, all the churches that he founded and how much time he spent in prayer for each of them. And accountability. He will have to give a, an account for his stewardship to his own master. A strong eschatological flavour of this letter. So you've got these two vertical relationships. How does this affect the horizontal relationship along the bottom of the triangle, the human interactions? Now, Paul knows he's an apostle of Christ. That could be, lead to an overbearing relationship. He said to be an apostle of Christ carries weight. Chapter two, verse seven. Um, verse six, nor did we seek glory from men, whether from you or from others, though we might have made demands, we might have come down heavy on you, literally, as apostles of Christ. It gives you real authority, but we don't want to use it. How do we want to interact with you? But we were gentle among you, like a nurse taking care of her children. So again, that sort of... Um, wavering on the cusp, if you like, between having authority but being very careful about using it. Now, the Paul is very aware of that God is teaching this church directly. He says in chapter 4 verse 9, concerning love of the brethren, you have no need to have anyone write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. Okay, that's fine. I don't need to do anything then. As an apostle, I am redundant, right? Well, not quite, because he said, yeah, and you do love all the brethren throughout Macedonia, but we exhort you, brethren, to do so more and more. The fact is Paul's job is exhorting them, and he's got to do it, even though maybe they don't need it, but he needs to say it, because that's part of his calling. So there's a really interesting sort of keeping the balance here. Um, being aware that of God's direct empowerment of the church could lead to an abdication of leadership. And I think that can be a danger with some theologies of leadership. As I say, you don't need anyone to write to you. You have all this amongst yourselves. But actually, Paul has to do his task as a leader because that's part of his calling. So the letter maintains a very delicate balance constantly aware of the calling of God, both in the leader and in the led. So Paul uses a rich series of metaphors, gentle as a nurse, moving on to fatherhood, a relationship of encouraging, exhorting, teaching to walk, encouraging independence, interestingly, not an infantilizing relationship, but one which is enabling, we were talking about this morning, and in enabling people to walk. He also speaks of his role in terms of modeling, being a role model, um, so that they can become role models themselves. It's hard work. It takes all the time and attention that a mature adult gives to earning a living. Laboring with the hands, losing sleep. Warning, being realistic, preparing for tough times. But as I say, this is about encouraging God's people to grow up taking seriously God's power among his people, but also taking immense pride, taking seriously the signs of God at work among others, 
as proof that my labour is not in vain. And note too, very strongly affective language within the letter itself. The Apostle uses lots of terms to bind together the kinship terms, brother and sister, but the we pronouns, when he talks about your Lord and mine. He's not afraid of revealing his own vulnerability, the fact that if the Thessalonians let him down, he will be deeply hurt. In fact, his, his own well-being is conditional on their faithfulness to God. Okay, so I recommend you to go to that letter and uh, look at it in more detail. Let's just flip through now some more headings. Uh, the source of apostolic leadership, we know most of what we know about leadership in detail in the New Testament comes from Paul himself because he tells us most about um, the, the leadership he knows from the inside. So that's where the richest resources are. Being an apostle is being sent, and again, it's this being sent on a mission, a commission. Whose mission is it? Uh, it's a sense of calling. Of course, starts with Paul, for Paul with the, the Damascus Road, Saul, Saul, the risen Christ calling his name. It's a prophetic calling. It's dependent on the divine grace, the charisma, it's a, and very important, the metaphor of the steward. He will have to give an account. Um, Paul uses a number of leadership images, the steward, the house builder, the gardener, the father, the nurse, the matchmaker. You remember that one? I had to look for that one. It's in 2 Corinthians. The ambassador, we are ambassadors for Christ. Laborers, and he talks about it, my co-workers a lot. The pilot, that comes in um, 1 Corinthians 12. But note how all of those images uh, model what I'm calling this three-cornered three model of leadership, that each of those is answerable to somebody else. And again, they remind us, particularly the steward, I think, it's a very strong reminder that we're in the world of Downton Abbey, where you know, the upstairs, downstairs world, this hierarchical world, where the world, the below-stairs world of the servants is completely distinct from the world of the, the master and the mistress. So Paul is very conscious that although he has authority, just as the butler or the housekeeper does in Downton Abbey, he is among the servants and that they are fellow servants not serving him but serving the master. His task is to resource and provision his fellow servants to do their service to somebody else. Okay, so I think that's a really important aspect. 1 Corinthians 4, uh, again, worth studying. If we look at some of the uh, later New Testament passages, we get the shepherd coming in. It's not uh, it used in Paul's core letters. Uh, we get it in Ephesians and as we saw in um, 1 Peter, in John's Gospel, of course, and in Matthew. Uh, the teacher, the leader, as we've seen, the watchman keeping watch over your souls, losing sleep over your souls, but again, having to give a <laughs> to somebody else. The fishermen, laborers in the harvest, and the steward. Again, really worth w exploring how those images work and why those images are preferred to the more conventional rulership and power images. I want just finally to, I think I flipped one there, to look at three case studies, and just do this very briefly, of how Paul exercises his apostolic leadership. Because I think we can say that, I'm not, sh I'm not saying that Paul had this triangle in mind, um, but to me the triangle makes sense of what's going on in these letters and this really quite complex relationship between Paul and his local churches, and I say his, the local churches which he founded. And I think I'd sum this up as that his aim is to keep the sides of the triangle equilateral, to keep it from getting distorted. Now one form of distortion is what we get in 1 Corinthians, where members of the church, you remember, formed into factions saying, I am of Paul, I am of Cephas, I am of Apollos. They are clearly assigning too high a role 
to the apostolic leaders who founded them. And Paul goes to war on this. He won't allow them to do this. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? They are servants. We are servants. We are the Apennai through whom you believed. Yes, our ministry was used by God to bring you to faith, and that's wonderful. Uh, but we are fellow servants. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. And you remember that's the passage where he said, there is only one found, the building has only one foundation, and that is Christ Jesus. What he's arguing against passionately is the idea that Paul and Peter and Apollos are on the same level as Jesus Christ, that there are people who follow Christ, there are people who follow Peter, people who follow Paul. That's a total distortion of what the church is. Christ is the foundation of the whole church and of every ministry within it. Um, so we are God's fellow workers. Extraordinary phrase that. You are God's, <coughs> God's building. When we come to 2 Corinthians, things are reversed. There's a very uh, interesting and rich letter to read, a quite a painful one, um, because clearly Paul's authority is being challenged by the Corinthians, partly in relationship to other apostles or those he can call super apostles coming from Jerusalem. But he is having to insist on his own authority, his own sufficiency which comes from God. Our sufficiency comes from God who has made us ministers or diaconite of the new covenant. And this does, he has to insist, this does give me authority. But I don't want to use it for breaking you down, but for building you up. So he is very much cast down by his experience with the Corinthians here. But because I have this diaconia, this commission by the grace of God, we do not lose heart. So 2 Corinthians is a really good letter to read. If you're finding your leadership is being contested and challenged and you are losing faith in it, you are losing confidence in it, we do not lose heart. Working together with him, we entreat you. Um, and yet Paul goes into deeply ironic mode as he tries to, he really doesn't like doing this, being pushed into defending his authority. Um, you bear it. If a man makes slaves of you or preys upon you or takes advantage of you or puts on airs or strikes you in the face, to my shame I must say we were too weak for that. There are abuses of power in today's church. There certainly were abuses of the power in the first century church. So he's forced into saying, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they servants? Are they diacono of Christ? I'm a better one. I'm talking like a madman. That's a crazy way to talk. With far greater labors, countless beatings, often near death. And then he goes on this sort of very ironic passage in 2 Corinthians 10 to 12, um, where he's, he says, he's being, you're forcing me to boast, but I will boast of the things that show my weakness that the power of Christ may rest upon me, for when I am weak, then I am strong. And here we get a very strong glimpse, runs all the way through the letters, of what it means to be a follower, to be a leader who is following the servant leadership of Christ. Because Paul is always forced back to this cross-shaped pattern of leadership, leadership from weakness, the, uh, the paradox of... Um, power in weakness that he finds in Christ. And then if you look at Philippians, Philippians I think models the perfectly equilateral, serene and happy relationship between Paul and that church. Thankful for your partnership, your koinonia in the gospel from the first day until now. It's a partnership, a relationship between equals. Um, part of the secret is there in 2, 12 to 13. As you have always obeyed, continue, not, I say, not obeyed me, me is not in the Greek, I think he's talking about obeying God, work out your own salvation in fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Um, and that wonderful reciprocal phrase, my God shall supply all your need. I know about this God and I know that he will supply all your need. But underlying all that is the passage we had as our epistle in the Eucharist this morning.
the cross-shaped, chaotic pattern that everything in that church's life is modelled on the self-giving of Christ. Um, and I always quote here, because I think it's really important, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Look at the New English Bible, which I think gets that one right, 1961. Let your bearing towards one another arise out of your life in Christ. The fact that you are in Christ determines everything about the shape of how you relate to one another. Okay, well, that's just a sketch of how I think this pattern works. And I say I would encourage you to go and delve into those passages in more detail. Let's just draw this to a close. We could talk a bit there about um, discipleship, about the ethos of apostolic <coughs> leadership. I could talk more about that if you'd like me to. Um, but just thinking, drawing to a close, thinking what does it mean to be a servant of Christ, a diakonos Christu? Is it a high status thing or a low status thing? Well, we've seen with Paul, it is, it is both. It does have, he does have authority as an apostle of Christ. It's something to be proud of, but it's also that something that commits him to that pattern of service. So it's both an enormous privilege and enormously humbling. And I'm quoting C.S. Lewis there from a different context, where he says both honor enough, it says being a son of Adam or a daughter, daughter of Eve, is both honour enough to erect the head of the poorest beggar and shame enough to bow the shoulders of the greatest emperor on earth. <coughs> Talking of emperors, if you've been in the church of uh, Aachen, a la chapelle, where the uh, Charlemagne, the Holy Roman Emperor, had his seat where he was crowned, there is a wooden, uh, a stone throne, the Empress throne at the back on the west wall of the cathedral. And it's carefully placed um, so that it is overshadowed by a crucifix, by the cross. And the guide told us that Charlemagne wanted it placed there to remind him of what leadership meant. Uh, and my last slide, a, friend, a good friend of mine who's a priest gave me this last week and I thought it's rather nice. Uh, just note how many of those Pauline metaphors and images are summed up in this, or New Testament images. <coughs> Give me the priest these graces shall possess of an ambassador, the just address, a father's tenderness, a shepherd's care, a leader's courage who the cross can bear. The leader has courage, the leader is a hero, brave enough to bear the cross. A ruler's arm, a watchman's wakeful eye, a pilot's skill, the helm in storms to ply, a fisher's patience, contemporary with Isaac Walton, and a labourer's toil, a guide's, that's the guide who is the leader who is also the guide, a guide's dexterity to disembroil. That's a useful one for parish life, isn't it? A prophet's inspiration from above, a teacher's knowledge, and a saviour's love. Thank you.